from the University of Miami, please welcome Dr. Caroline Mortensen, Dr. Dana Shalala, and Dr. Julio Frank. Good afternoon. Always important to note that Secretary Shalala is a person and not just a building, the building we happen to be enjoying today. She'll often walk around campus and say, I'm Donna Shalala, I'm a person, not a building. <laughs> so what an honor to be sharing. Thank you for sharing your facility with all of us today. I'm Caroline Mortensen. I'm a professor here at the University of Miami in Health Management and Policy. And I happen to be on the faculty along with Dr. Donna Shalala and Dr. Julio Frank. And uh, missing from our three amigos today, but here in spirit, is Secretary Alex Azar, who was HHS Secretary for the Trump Administration, who sits on our faculty as well. So we may well be the only university in the globe that has three Health and Human Services secretaries or ministers sitting on our faculty. So always a very fun conversation um, when we get the team together to have these discussions. So our discussion today is going to focus on the, uh, the future of healthcare. And so from their roles as, as secretaries, uh, President Frank from Mexico and Dr. Shalala here in the United States, but other roles as well. President Frank is overseeing a, a massive health system here, as well as our undergraduate and, and graduate programs. So he sort of straddles this, um, the future of higher education, as well as the future of healthcare and the decisions he's making on a daily basis. And then Professor Shalala brings in her background as a member of Congress as well. So a lot of different perspectives for today's conversation. Now, the first question that I wanted to ask first, Dr. Frank, and then to Secretary Shalala, is um, some of these obstacles that we're facing now in terms of higher education and that intersection with healthcare. And in, in many ways, we're training our workforce now to solve problems that we don't even know exist yet, right? We're training our workforce now, particularly in healthcare, for the future. So what are some of the struggles with that? And what are some of the solutions for, for training this future healthcare workforce, President Frank? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, you know, we talk about the health system as an abstraction. The health system is all about people. It's a group of people who have a, a different health-related needs and a group of people who've been trained and entrusted through both extensive training and commitment to a code of conduct that's based on the notion of service. They, they get together in the health system. That's what the health system is all about. So making sure that the workforce is adequately educated to fulfill that fundamental role is absolutely critical, just like with the patient side. Patients are co-producers of their own health. They just don't just receive health. So also that education is very important. But the, you know, the point I, I, I realize is that after the pandemic, the two sectors of the economy that probably are going to experience or are experiencing already the most substantial structural disruptions are healthcare and higher education. Other sectors had a lot of disruptions. The, hospitality, the transport industry, but they're going back. Airplanes are flying just like they were before the pandemic. That's not going to happen with either higher education or healthcare. Things will never be like they were before the pandemic. And actually, many of those changes started before the pandemic, and the pandemic just accelerated them. And so, you know, when we talk about the education of health professionals, that's exactly, as Professor Mortensen just said, that's exactly at the interface between those two sectors. It's what happens with healthcare, what happens with higher education. We here at the University of Miami have an academic health system with a medical school and a nursing school. We're exactly at the intersection. So uh, as we look forward to a very different uh, uh, landscape for both of those sectors and the way they interact, I think we're going to have to, um, to reimagine, uh, uh, specifically in the case of the way we educate health professionals. We had seldom see, had so much visibility of what the health sector is as during the pandemic. It gave a lot of visibility. Uh, ironically, it also saw a lot of members of the profession abandoning the profession just because of burnout. At the same time, we, they, they deservedly 
uh, were uh, being called heroes, and they were the heroes of the pandemic, the doctors, the nurses, the health per personnel. At the same time, they were leaving the profession in unprecedented numbers just because of the tension, the, the burnout. And so we have both a quantitative imbalance, there's, there's a shortage, and a qualitative imbalance. Recently, uh, in November of last year, we actually held right here a conference on the future of health professional education. And of all the things that were mentioned there, um, and, and there was an accompanying paper in the, in the journal, The Lancet, which is probably the most influential health-related journal in the world, uh, that appeared at the, at the end of October. So anyone who's interested in more details can consult that. Uh, but I would summarize the basic proposals in three big ideas. The first one is we need to embrace the concept of education for life. Because as Professor Mortensen just said, we, our graduates are facing the most dynamic labor market in history. While you are being educated, and this applies to every field, not just health professionals, while you're being educated, advances in automation and especially in artificial intelligence are transforming the nature of jobs and are creating new jobs. So almost by definition, you cannot acquire everything you need to know while you're at school. So once people graduate, they need to embark in a lifelong journey of learning. Education for life has that meaning of lifelong learning, but it also has the meaning of being educated to lead a meaningful, rewarding uh, life as a member of a community, being able to get a job for sure, that's part of having a rewarding career, but it also has other, other components. But that idea that uh, what we've had as a closed system of education where people come in, get educated, and then go out must, must, must give way to an open architecture of educational institutions where people are coming in and out throughout different phases of their life as their educational needs evolve, partly as a function of the dynamism in the labor market. That's idea number one. The second is health professionals need to start mastering new competence, new capabilities. The, again, the advance, the technological advances are posing uh, unprecedented opportunities, but also challenges. And just like we talk about being literate and knowing how to learn and read, everyone needs to be num numerate in an era of big data and has to be competent in, in, in some of the disruptive technologies that are now part of what we do in healthcare. And the third big message was, and it's derived from the second one, that we need a new conception of teamwork. The idea of the solo professional has, is long gone, but today the sort of teams that form the core of healthcare need to be enriched. So we propose the idea not just of interprofessional education, where we bring together students in medical and nursing school and the other health professions so that they can get trained together to work as a team, which is what they are going to face in the reality of the workforce. Today, we need to embrace transprofessional education, meaning by that that a lot of non-health professionals are finding their main source of employment in the health system. The health system is the largest sector of the U.S. economy. It's almost 20% of the U.S. economy. And therefore, it's the main source of employment for you know, a number of professions, traditional professions like managers or like lawyers. But today, it's also a main source, and it's probably going to become the main source of employment for computer scientists, for programmers, for experts in artificial intelligence, because some of the biggest applications lie exactly there. So we need to think of those non-health professionals working in health settings as part of the team that has to deal with the complex and evolving nature of, uh, of the needs of, of patients and populations. Secretary Shalala? Well, I echo what my colleague here has said. I think I'd say it slightly differently. Um, when I talk to uh, parents and students, I tell them that our responsibility is not simply to educate them for their first job, but for their third job. It's the quality, um, it's, it's those qualities. We want them to be able to absorb new technologies. We want them to have uh, a context in which they understand the world around them. But the most important thing is that they can adjust to new knowledge. And it's, um, you can call it lifelong learning, but if they don't start out with an ability um, and, and take the kind of courses in which um, they have an ability to absorb new knowledge, uh, 
uh, I would be worried about the I would be worried about the future. And what they should learn has turned out to be much more complicated uh, for that third job. Um, once on President's Day, uh, by luck, um, uh, President Clinton bounced into my class on health policy. Literally bounced in. He was still in his golf clothes. And, uh, uh, you know, I was talking about Medicare and their eyes were glazing over. And uh, um, uh, so I said to the students, ask him any question. And one of the students said, what courses do I need to, to take so that I can someday be president of the United States? He gave the best answer I've ever heard. He said, be a sponge. <laughs> he said, I can't actually predict precisely what courses uh, you're going to need in the future, but I do know this, that you ought to get a broad education. It ought not to be so narrow. Um, and that's our challenge in healthcare because we have to anticipate the future and we're not quite sure exactly the education and training that our students will need, but we do know the quality of mind yep. that they'll need to absorb those new ideas. So that's my answer. Be a sponge. <laughs> I think th this is critical. I mean, we talk about an I-shaped learning right. where you have a foundation, foundational knowledge. Everyone who goes to a university should know that the earth is actually round. <laughs> uh, you have the vertical part of the eye, which is your specialization, but then you have this sort of integrative capabilities, right. critical thinking, learning how to learn, right. ethical reasoning, ability to work as a team. That part is, is absolutely critical for, for what President Shalala is saying. So healthcare provider shortages are an issue we're facing in the future, but we're already starting to struggle with now. So President Frank, what's your perspective on what can we be doing to address some of these provider shortages? Where do you see some of the big, biggest issues now or in the future as it relates to provider shortages? I mean, the labor market for health professionals are global. Um, the, 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 the character of scientific knowledge is, is, is global. And, and therefore, these are globally integrated uh, labor markets, but there are a lot of barriers to the movement of people, uh, sometimes depending on broader policies regarding migration. Uh, what you see around the world is almost in every country, serious imbalances, uh, countries where there are not enough nurses uh, or doctors, and countries where you actually have an excess of, of doctors because everyone wants to live in a city and within the country you don't have enough doctors on the countryside, but you have uh, unemployed or underemployed doctors on, uh, driving cabs in the cities. I think treating this as a global labor market is a good thing. Uh, and, and so I, I am in favor of uh, allowing and enabling the movement of health professionals uh, around the world. But it's gotta, do, it's gotta be done in a in a frame that's predictable and that doesn't uh, inadvertently affect the poorer countries, which are usually the, sender, the sending countries, uh, in what would be a very regressive redistribution because in most of those countries, educating a nurse, for example, is typically done in public sector universities. In public universities, they get subsidized. And then you know, once the nurse is trained, she or he moves to a rich country and you're in effect subsidizing that education. So there's been a lot of discussion and there is a framework that was actually um, negotiated at the World Health Organization for a code in which receiving countries, typically richer countries, would compensate and help build capacity. With that, then uh, I think uh, that would compensate the so-called brain drain uh, and, and actually allow that movement that also has enormous benefits in terms of remittances and of people who uh, actually don't stay their entire lives but come and work here for a period of time and then go back. There's enormous advantages in allowing the free movement of doctors and nurses within those rules that do not uh, seriously jeopardize the sustainability of efforts in the poorer countries and doesn't actually become a subsidy to the richer countries. The other story is the barriers that are imposed by the receiving countries, but the, there I think Donna has much more <laughs> uh, experience on, on, on dealing with that. Yes, yeah, so what are some of those barriers? Well, we have 30,000 nurses that are sitting outside of the United States waiting for the State Department to give them interviews. They've passed all the tests, they speak English, uh, and it, they could ease some of the uh, pressures here on, um, 
on the nursing shortage, but um, I worry about the equity issues. I worry about uh, um, highly trained nurses that leave countries that really need them, and they leave for opportunity, the same way everybody migrates. Uh, uh, they leave for opportunities in other places, and of course, we're happy to have them as our other wealthier uh, uh, countries. So um, we have barriers within this country. We have a supply uh, problem here um, in large part because uh, during COVID, for instance, we didn't let our uh, baby nurses, that is the nurses in training, into our hospitals. And we didn't do that because the hospital personnel did not have time to supervise them. So all those clinical experiences were slowed down and now we're trying to ca play catch up. Um, and the, uh, the accreditation agencies require all of that. Now we loosened up on some of it in terms of uh, nurses moving across state borders. There was a lot more uh, flexibility. I think governors finally realized that they were responsible uh, for the rules, not the federal government, so that there was more flexibility. But we need to look at um, the personnel shortage in the allied health professionals the same way we've looked at the supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. from, from the beginning of entry, because we're concerned about equity, um, right down to when someone uh, enters the job market. And we need to do it in a systematic way with all the stakeholders in healthcare. Um, and we have to, from an international point of view, be extremely careful um, about our investments in uh, um, the developing world in particular to make sure that they have the kind of infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure that will make a difference uh, for their own people. So I feel that responsibility that Julio uh, talked about at the same time, we need to be more systematic here as opposed to haphazard about uh, the training of people in the allied health professions as well as nurses and nursing assistants and, and doctors, frankly. So financing of healthcare is always top of mind. The Biden administration just released their budget and their vision for the future of financing of healthcare. President Frank, what are some of the things that the US and globally we struggle with, with figuring out how to pay for healthcare and, and how to generate that tax base? Well, let me um, address, since we have very limited time, just one factor that I think is important. There is a demographic reality and a, and a demographic transition and an epidemiologic transition. We have been victims of our success in, in healthcare because you know, we've been able to stop uh, children from dying when they're young or women from ch dying in, in childbirth, although there's still a huge unfinished agenda, both inequities, both among and within countries, including in this country, when it comes to maternal mortality. By and large, we've made the most amazing progress uh, in, in reducing under five and maternal mortality by and large. Uh, those people who don't no longer die of those uh, causes now live long enough to experience much more difficult, uh, hard to prevent, more, more costly diseases. And that's what's called the epidemiologic transition. At the same time, there's a demographic transition. And you know we need to be aware that the world is about to enter an era which is unprecedented in human history of an inverted population pyramid where there are more older people than younger people. Uh, it's already happening. I mean, China already last year had a negative growth in, in, in China because of the one-child policies, an accelerated version of that. The United States is still not experiencing that, mostly because of migration, which is bringing younger people here. But that's a reality that I just want to highlight as a structural long-term constraint in terms of how we finance everything, healthcare prominently, because the, that different population pyramid, that inverted population pyramid, is going to pose enormous um, structural challenges in the, in, the, in the immediate, medium, and long-term. Secretary Schleyle. No, to the that? extent that people pay taxes to pay for the healthcare system, um, having this shift to uh, more elderly people is a challenge in a number of countries, including China. China has a workforce problem yeah. um, in addition to that. But, you know, I think age is only a number. And rethinking those of us that have uh, looked at um, 
at the aging problem, the literature talks about the fact that you can integrate, particularly with remote um, working now, you could integrate older people into the workforce. Uh, this cutoff at 65 or at 60 is ridiculous. And with healthier people, we could actually um, have an impact on the workforce, at least, and keep people working. Um, and, and certainly, one of the transitions of COVID is really the transition of the workforce staying at home and working the remote uh, working uh, patterns, um, in addition to its impact on the healthcare system. And I think that uh, I don't know whether China will do it that way. I doubt it. Um, but um, certainly there are other countries that are starting to think about um, organizing jobs in a way which will support a workforce of the future that, is, that may be older and not just economically driven. We've, uh, we've had these workforce where people just don't have enough to live on, so they have to work uh, until their later years. But uh, there are ways of doing this and attacking that that issue in a much more creative way. Please join me in thanking our panel and thank you for your time. <laughs>